Hi. Uh, today we'll talk about uh, two important hormones, the oxytocin and the um, ADH, antidiuretic hormone. Uh, both hormones are secreted uh, from the posterior pituitary gland. As you can see from the figure, you can see, let's put a pointer. As you can see from the figure, the neurosecretory cells in the hypothalamus stimulate, uh, sec uh, um, convey its, uh, its um, neurosecretory material to the posterior pituitary gland from which to the bloodstream uh, the ADH and oxytocin is released. The ADH is responsible for kidney uh, tubules and retention of water, while the oxytocin majorly have two major functions, uh, stimulation and the maturation of the, matu uh, of the mem mem mammary glands and as well the uh, contraction of the uterine muscles. For the oxytocin, which is generally called the love hormone, oxytocin is a nine amino acid uh, peptide that is formed in the hypothalamus and the uh, hypothalamic nerves and transported down the axons to the posterior pituitary for secretion in the blood. Oxytocin is also secreted um, uh, within the, bra the brain and the form if, and from other few other tissues, including, including ovaries and testes. It is uh, the precursor hormone of oxytocin is called pre pro oxytocin so it needs to be uh, processed in order to have a functional oxytocin. So oxytocin only differs from uh, ADH in two of the nine amino acids that it form oxytocin, as, you, as, as we will see later. Both hormones, either ADH or uh, the uh, oxytocin, is packaged into granules and secreted along with a carrier protein called neurophysins. It actually affects our mood and the motor function. So the oxytocin affects our moods and motor function and act mainly, as we said, on the mammary gland and the uterus. It increases the contraction of smooth muscles of the, and uh, smooth muscles of the vast difference in males. Of course, you know the vast difference is uh, the duct that uh, car that um, uh, convey or uh, uh, pass sperms from the testes uh, to the outside. It's a secretion. The oxytocin is increased during labor, and they may act also to facilitate the sperm transport in the uterus. So if you can see here, this is the structure of the oxytocin of the uh, amino acids. It's a nine amino acids. And the, uh, you can see from the figure that the hypothalamic uh, uh, neurons secrete oxytocin. You can see it secretes oxytocin uh, in the hypothesis. The oxytocin is recruited into the blood vessels where it is secreted directly to the blood from the posterior pituitary gland. So oxytocin, can be controlled by a positive feedback mechanism where the release of the hormone causes an action which is stimulates more of its own release. And that's a, a, a typical example of a positive feedback. So let's see the physiological effects of oxytocin. The first important thing is the stimulation of milk injection. As we said, a positive feedback involved in the milk ejection reflux. So when milk is initially secreted into small sacs within the mammary gland, these sacs are called alveoli, from which it must be ejected for consumption or harvesting by babies during suckling. So the mammary alveoli are surrounded actually by smooth muscle cells, the myoepithelium, which are a prominent target cell for oxytocin. If, so if you think closely, so the major target of oxytocin actually is muscles. So it contracts the muscles of the uh, uterus as well the muscles, the smooth muscles, and of course it's involuntary muscles. And uh, it uh, uh, promotes the contraction of the smooth muscles as well, but which is surrounding the mammalian alveoli to help in the ejection of the milk during suckling. The oxytocin stimulate the contraction of these myoepithelial cells, causing milk to be ejected into the ducts. So it, oxytocin can be used as well as drug. An intranasal uh, dose of two to five uh, minutes before breastfeeding promotes milk ejection. And of course, this um, 
uh, is used for uh, mothers that have uh, problems in the release of uh, or in the formation of oxytocin. The second major function of the oxytocin is the stimulation of uterine muscle, smooth muscle uh, contraction uh, during birth. At the end of the gestation period, the uterus must contract vigorously and for a prolonged period of time in order to deliver the fetus. So oxytocin is released during labor when the fetus stimulates the cervix and the vagina and it enhances the contraction of uterine smooth muscle, of course, to facilitate a birth. In case where uterine contractions are not sufficient to complete delivery, so physicians and veterinarians, in case of animal, sometimes can use oxytocin, can inject the mother with oxytocin to further stimulate uterine contraction. So oxytocin can be used as a drug as well for induction of labor. Low dose is given as a start to be escalated to achieve optimum response of contraction, which the optimum response is three contraction in 10 minutes, each lasting 40, 45 seconds. So physicians try to mimic what normally happen and to try to give uh, successive doses, low doses, low doses, to escalate the uh, time response for the uh, contraction. As we said, the optimum uh, response of contraction is three contraction in 10 minutes, each lasting for 45 seconds. So at that time, the mother uh, 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 will knew that uh, it, it, it should deliver at any moment. So what about the control of oxy oxy oxytocin secretion? As we said, the stimulation for release of hypothalamic oxytocin is initiated by physical stimulation of the nipples physical or which, which, which have a lot of mechanoreceptors. What's the meaning of mechanoreceptors? That's receptor that could got triggered by uh, uh, mechanical movement of the nipples. The act of nursing or suckling is relayed within few milliseconds to the brain via the spinal reflex arc. Actually, it's the same uh, reflex arc that, that occur in our knee and in the same reflex arc, uh, the same actually principle, not the same ana anatomical structure, okay? So, and as well, it is the same reflex arc that occurs for our eyelids when dust come inside our eye and we involuntarily closes our eye. So the suckling and nursing is relayed in a few milliseconds to the brain via spinal uh, reflex arc. These signals affect this uh, neuron that secretes oxytocin, leading to the release of oxytocin. So a number of factors can inhibit oxytocin release, among them stress. For example, oxytocin neurons are repressed by catecholamines, which are released from the adrenal gland in response to stress. That's meaning if a mother needs to breastfeed her babies and she is in continuous uh, uh, stress, continuous stress, continuous stress, you will find that it will not, she will not be able to produce milk for the baby because the stress suppresses oxytocin release. When this oxytocin is administrated as a drug, the circulating half-life of oxytocin maximum five minutes. And it's very obvious. It has a very uh, short half-life time because it's a very potent hormone, although it is only nine amino acid uh, protein peptide. Okay, so its maximum half-life, its circulating half-life reaches five minutes as a plasma uterus and placenta of pregnant women contain enzyme oxycinase, oxy oxytocinase. So that's the enzyme that degrade oxytocin. The circulating half-life can be extended in 10 to 15 minutes in non-pregnant women. Both the production of oxytocin and the response to oxytocin are modulated by the circulating levels of sex hormone or sex steroids. Another well-studied effect of a steroid hormone is the marked increase in the synthesis of uterine or myo myometrial oxygen. So we understand now that oxytocin can be secreted from the uter uterus. 
oxygen late in, in gestation, resulting from increasing circulation. Uh, um, uh, sorry again. So it can be uh, the increased uh, uh, effect of this hormone because of the increased level of the uterine oxytocin receptor late in gestation, resulting from increasing concentration of circulating estrogen. So recently, oxytocin have been shown to mediate a very peculiar phenomena, as you can see from the figure, which is the mirror imaging of neuron system. So this phenomena, it's a social perception and behavior as the mirror neuron system, MNS. This including empathy, trust, generosity, emotions, recognition, social cognition, and intergroup perception. So mirror neurons are one of the most important discoveries in the last decade of neuroscience. So what is mirror, mirror neurons? So mirror neurons represent a distinctive class of neuron that discharge both when an individual executes a motor act and when he observes another individual performing the same or similar uh, motor act. Okay, so the famous example of that uh, mirror neuron uh, example is when you yawn, when you yawn, uh, when you yawn, another friend of you, if you, he saw you, he yawn straight away. So scientists discovered that there is a kind of mirror neuron that can mirror this uh, motor act similarly. So here is the example, oxytocin may activate the mirror neuron system, and you can see in the example how is yawning can activate another person uh, to yawn uh, due to this motor act, and this was accounted for the mirror neuron uh, system. For the oxytocin disease states, the disease associated with the hypersecretion of the oxytocin is galactoria, pituitary adenoma, hyperprolactonemia and the prolactonemia and the hypothyroidism. So these are the diseases associated with the hypersecretion of oxytocin. Now we'll talk about the antidiuretic hormone. And as you can see, it's, it's actually the same, uh, it's a very uh, similar in a structure to the oxytocin. And roughly 60% of the mass of the body, as you know, of course, that 60% of the mass of the body is water. Despite the wide variation of uh, this amount of water taken each day, the body water content remain stable. So what, what you lose, uh, when you lose water from lungs, sweat, or feces, and urine on daily basis, had to be uh, compensated. So the control of body water and solute concentration is a function of a several hormones. It's not ADH only. On these uh, several hormones, but the major one, of course, is ADH. These several uh, hormones act on two major uh, sis uh, systems or organs, the kidneys and the vascular system. ADH is a key player in this process, also known as a vasopressin or arginine vasopressin. The half-life minutes, half-life time from 18 to 20 minutes. It is a nine amino acid as oxytocin secreted by the posterior pituitary gland within the hypothalamic neurons. The hypothalamus, the hormone, is packaged in secret, the same as oxytocin, into package into protein, carrier protein called the neurofacin, and both are released upon hormone and secretion. So you can see here the difference between oxytocin and the vasopressin or the ADH. You can see only the difference in two amino acids. It have the same sequence of nucleotides, you can see here, and you can see the disulfide bonds that is formed between the first amino acid and the sixth amino acid. Actually, it is the same as well in vasopressin and oxytocin. Again, the only difference in the amino acid on the position three and the amino acid in position uh, eight. It's the phenylalanine and the arginine in, uh, in uh, vasopressin or an ADH, and it is uh, isoleucine and the leucine in the oxytocin. So what's the physiological effect of ADH? The, the major effect, the first effect is the effect on effects on kidney. 
actually it is the retention of water. So ADH it conserves body water by reducing the loss of water in urine. It's a diuretic, a diuretic is an agent that increases the urine formation. And of course, ADH is not a diuretic. It's a definition for diuretic agents. Injection of a small amount of ADH into a, a person or animal results in antidiuresis or decreased formation of urine. So ADH binds to a receptor on cells in the collecting ducts of the kidney and promotes reabsorption of water back into the circulation. So what happens in the absence of ADH? In the absence, the collecting ducts are impermeable to water. So if there is no ADH, the collecting gut will be impermeable to water and it flows out as urine. So that means water will not be reabsorbed. EDH stimulates the water reabsorption by stimulating insertion of water channels or aquaporins into the membrane of kidney tubules. So actually aquaporins from the name implies that it transports water okay through the membrane so once there is an adh more aquaporin will be in the membrane of the kidney tubules which will promote the transfer and reabsorption of water into the blood vessels this aquaporin transport a solute free water through cells and back into the blood, leading to a decrease in the plasma osmolarity and increase in the osmolarity of the urine. So we'll see here the effect of um, ADH on, on um, the um, uh, kidneys especially. So in case of uh, <coughs> too uh, little uh, water, too little water, it starts with the hypothalamus, detect this uh, to a little water. Just hold on, please. So the hypothalamus detected these two little water in blood, which soon uh, give rise to the pituitary gland releasing the ADH. This ADH will act on the kidney to maintain this water level and to stop losing water, losing water outside the body. So after that, so less water is lost in urine and the urine become more concentrated. So you can, you can notice that at some days, if your urine is a deep brown or a deep yellow, that means it's heavily concentrated. And these blood water levels, after this process, the blood water levels return to normal. In the other case, if there is too much of water, the, the signal is reversed. So the hypothalamus will detect too much water in, in the blood. So the pituitary gland releases less ADH. So from here, you can understand that ADH is always released either, but, but either according to the condition of the body either in high amount or low amount. So in the case of too much water in the blood, this is sensed by the hypothalamus, which uh, triggers the pituitary gland to release less ADH. And of course, this will reduce uh, blood uh, reab uh, water reabsorption into the blood. And this lead to motor, more water reaches uh, bladder and to the outside, so urine is more diluted. And so the blood water level returns uh, to normal. So that means in, in these cases, you will see the urine having very uh, clear color as if it is only water. And sometimes if you dr drink a lot amount of water, you will see uh, the urine having the color of uh, a very, very, very pale yellow. So we have seen in these uh, two figures, how the uh, kidney is controlled by the secretion of the ADH from the posterior pituitary. So let's see mechanistic, uh, it's not actually purely mechanistic, let's see description what's uh, uh, continuing the effect on the kidney. Uh, 
So in the, as you know, this is a structure of the nephron, is a basic unit of the kidney. It starts with a Bauman uh, uh, capsule that lead to a proximal, a proximal uh, a, a, a tubule, then lobe of Henle. Lobe of Henle is ascending, and, uh, uh, sorry, descending, then ascending. Then uh, all, of, all of the nephrons is collected into the collecting ducts. So you can see here, that, uh, that uh, water majorly uh, is reabsorbed in the collect, as we said, in the collecting uh, uh, tubules, uh, collecting duct, sorry, in the collecting duct. And you can see that the cells lining the collecting duct is uh, full of aquaporins, which facilitate these orange uh, dots. Let's have a pointer that facilitate, facilitate these orange dots, which represent water, to go uh, to reabsorb uh, back to the uh, blood vessels that occur in the medulla. So the result of that, that you have a small uh, volume, small volume of concentrated urine are released outside of the body. So if you go deep uh, closer, for each uh, cell of the collecting duct, so you can see uh, here, these actually the cells of the uh, collecting uh, duct. And this actually is a principal cell lying the collecting duct. duct. And you have the basolateral membrane, you have the peritribular uh, fluid, uh, and you have uh, the capillary that uh, have uh, the blood the capillary that passes uh, near the collecting duct, duct. So you can see here, this is the epithelial membrane and this is the basal membrane. So you can see that aquaporin is heavily represented on the membrane. And you can see it starts uh, as, as, as a mechanism that initiated uh, by the release of ADH. So let's start from the beginning. So ADH released in the uh, blood from the uh, posterior pituitary and reach this capillary inside the kidney, the ADH represented by the blue circles. circles. This ADH can move until it binds on the, uh, on the receptor, the AD receptor, ADH receptor on the basement, basement membrane of the uh, collecting duct cell. The binding of the ADH receptor, uh, ADH to its receptor, uh, uh, activate the G protein that, uh, that soon activate the adenylocyclase to form the cyclic AMP, one of the important second messenger we have talked uh, back in uh, uh, previous lectures. This cyclic AMP activate protein kinase A, which lead to the recruitment of the already made aquaporin to the uh, surface uh, of the membrane. As soon as a lot of aquaporin is uh, recruited to the membrane, it facilitates the the transport of water from the collecting duct, so water is here, to, to the uh, tubule, cell tubule itself, and there is another aquaporin at the basement membrane, which is a different type, aquaporin 3. The, here, the, the type of the aquaporin is aquaporin 2. The aquaporin 3 facilitates the movement of water back into the blood stream. So you can notice that, even aquaporin, it's a protein, of course, transport protein uh, specifically for water. It's a, it's a protein, but have a different uh, isoforms. An isoform, which is called the two, is represented on the epical membrane of the collecting duct uh, tub uh, cell. And, and, and the version that is aquaporin-3 is represented in the uh, basement uh, uh, membrane. So what's the effect on the vascular system? What is the vasopressor action, uh, pressor action? And actually, that's, that's explained why the antidiuretic hormone has another name, which is called vasopressin. okay? So let's see. So the high concentrations of ADH cause widespread constriction of arteries, which lead to increase in the pressure in the artery. And due to this effect, the name vasopressin was coined. In healthy human, ADH has minimum uh, pressure effect. So that means that ADH will not affect majorly the blood, the heart pressure, but it's only affecting the contraction of the blood vessels. So you can see here that the hypothalamus, 
which can be stimulated by the hyperosmolarity, the decrease or atri atrial uh, receptor uh, firing, and the angiotensin, another hormone, it's called angiotensin 2, and of course, the sympathetic stimulation lead to the activation of the posterior pituitary gland, leading to the release of vasopressin or ADH. This uh, function of this uh, vasopressin, you can see that they discriminated into two versions of the vasopressin, in which one version will lead to the constriction of the blood vessel, and this will increase the systemic vascular resistance. And as well, the other one, the, ver the other version will lead to retention of the water and the fluid reabsorption, and of course, this will increase the blood volume. Both of these will increase the, at, at the arterial, uh, the arterial uh, pressure. So how about the control of ADH secretion? So as we said, the plasma osmolarity or concentration of solute in blood regulate ADH secretion. The osmolarity stimulates in neurons known as osmoreceptors. It's a kind of receptors that is triggered by the change in osmolality in the hypothalamus. And those neurons, in turn, stimulate secretion of neurons that produce ADH. So it's a cascade of reaction among neurons. When plasma osmolarity is below, below a 13 threshold, the osmoreceptors are not activated and ADH secretion is suppressed. When this osmolarity increase above the threshold, the osmoreceptors stimulate the neurons that are responsible for secretion of ADH to the posterior pituitary. So actually, these two sentences explain this sentence. So ADH secretion and thirst, al -atash, are stimulated by hypothalamic osmoreceptors. It's a level of neurons that above the neurons that secrete uh, ADH. The osmotic threshold for ADH secretion is lower than for thirst. So that's obvious because a, a body has to be equipped to be ready to secrete ADH before sensing thirst. الجسم لازم يكون مهيئ إن يقدر يحس بنقص المية ويفرز ADH قبل ما الجسم بيوصل لحالة العطش. So that's why the osmotic threshold for ADH secretion is lower than for thirst. The second control of uh, osmotic secretion is the nausea, vomiting, and stress are potent stimuli of ADH. So, of course, these, these, these uh, all uh, mechanisms are controlled by region in the brain with links to the hypothalamus. The third control of ADH secretion is decrease in the blood pressure and volume stimulate as well ADH secretion. Of course, because one of the functions of ADH is vas vasoconstriction. So when it, there is a, a decrease in the blood pressure, uh, that means the, uh, the, uh, the pressure is uh, decreased and that means it need, the, the vessels need to be contracted to increase the blood pressure. So that decrease in pressure and the volume of the blood are sensed by stretch receptors. So these are the third type of receptor we deal with in ADH. So we have initially uh, the uh, uh, osmoreceptor, we have uh, 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 stretch receptors, and we have as well, if you remember for the oxytocin, the mechanoreceptors. So these stretch receptors are in the heart and large arteries. So the changes in the blood pressure and volume are not nearly as sensitive as a stimulator as increased osmolarity, but they are potent in severe condition. So the, uh, that's meaning that this uh, uh, change in blood pressure and volume uh, 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 is not severe, but the more severe is the change in osmolarity. For example, the loss of 15 to 20 percent of blood volume by hemorrhage, for example, result in a massive secretion of ADH because blood volume has been decreased. So the blood pressure as well is decreased. So what's the ADH disease states? 
The most common disease of men and the, and the animals related to ADH is diabetes insipidus. This condition can arise from either of two situations. The first one is a hypothalamic diabetes insipidus, in which results from a deficiency in ADH secretion. And this causes a, a, a head trauma and infections and the tumors due to uh, in, uh, head trauma infections or tumors involving the hypothalamus. The second cause of uh, this uh, uh, condition is nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So this occurs when the kidney is unable, so there is already enough amount of ADH, but the kidney is unable to respond to that ADH. So it resulted from some types of renal diseases, mutations in the ADH receptor. So it might, there is an ADH receptor as well, but this receptor is defective due to mutation in its gene. Uh, or in the gene, or it may be the defect in the gene encoding the aquaporin 2, which is responsible for moving transport of water from the uh, lumen to the inside of the uh, uh, kidney tubule. The major signs of either type of diabetes insipidus is excessive urine production. That's a major sign that you have a lot of urine, you are releasing a lot of urine, that means uh, your kidney is not controlling the amount of water reabsorbed. Some human patients produce as much as 16 liters of urine per day. The hypothalamic uh, diabetes insidious, of course, can be treated just by adding, by taking uh, exogenous ADH as a drug. And this concludes our today's lecture. I'm waiting for your uh, questions.